On this week's prequel episode, we follow up on our James and the Giant Peach listener polls, learn about the YA dystopia boom, and preview Insurgent. Hello, welcome back to This Film Is It, the podcast where we talk about movies that are based on books. It is another prequel episode. We have all of our segments and quite a bit to talk about, so we're going to get right into it with our patron shoutouts. I put up with you because your father and mother were our finest patrons, that's why. No new patrons this week, but we do have our Academy Award winners, and they are Vic Dangerously, Mathilde, Steve from Arizona, Paul, Jeff Niederhofer, Teresa Schwartz, Ian from Wine Country, Winchester's Forever, Kelly Napier, Gray Hightower, Gratch, Just Gratch, Shelby Says, Pay Writers, That Darn Skag, V Frank, and Alina Starkov. Thank you all very much for continuing to support us. The Academy Award winning level. Katie, let's see what the people had to say about James and the Giant Peach. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like. Uh... Your opinion, man. All right. Well, on Patreon, we had an even split. Three Mm. votes for the book and three votes for the movie. A handful of fish bones said, I must have watched this movie a lot more than I thought. So many of the lines and scenes are etched into my brain, if I remember correctly. When I was little, I didn't like the centipede because of the way he lies and when his fuck up gets them in trouble. It would make me so upset I would stop watching until the pirate ship bit was over. Watching as an adult, I still don't like the centipede, but recognize that I'm being a little unhinged about it. Also, I really love the rhino confrontation scene. The weirdness around the thematic elements doesn't really bother me. There's just something cathartic about someone screaming in defiance at a physical embodiment of hovering fear in their life. Anyway, for the sake of nostalgia, I give it to the movie. Sweet. Uh, that's a lot of fun. I I don't think I hated Centipede as a kid. Maybe I did. I don't know. I, I agree that his character design is a little creepy. I think somebody else said the same thing. Oh, they and say a, that and about, another. I thought they were saying they like don't like his personality. This is the vibe. Oh yeah, I, I guess it is. There was another person who like <laughs> oh, talked specifically about yeah. the character design though. But I my point being that I think Centipede got a little more uh criticism <laughs> than any of the yeah. other characters. And, and he is intentionally unlikable for parts of it because yes. that's the character arc he has to go on. So it did its job if, as a kid, you were like, I hate this guy. I'm not supposed <laughs> to like him. Our next comment was from Steve from Arizona, um, who said, This was a tough one. Having grown up with Roald Dahl and Shel Silverstein and weird-ass choose-your-own-adventure books where I get eaten by ants and die on distant planets, the nostalgia this type of literature has always brings a smile. It's bizarre, unique, and creates quite a picture. But I will go with the movie, mainly because I have a deep appreciation for stop-motion animation. It's weird how so much media I consumed as a kid is so dark and horrifying. I guess there is a reason why I'm a curmudgeon. Plus, Miss Spider, she is goth and I will die on that hill. She's just French. <laughs> I think I think she's 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 pretty goth in the yes, movie. Yes, no, she is. She's like I, I think it's less goth, more she's like um kind of like beatnik. I think she's yeah. supposed to be like a French yeah. like arty like you know. Yeah, she hangs out in like the poetry night clubs. Yeah, yeah, because she has the thing. little what you, the little um the beret. beret and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she's supposed to be yeah like a like a smoking mm-hmm. hip French like a proto goth. Yes. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Our last comment on Patreon was from Matilde. Uh, Matilde said, This was my first read and first watch. Somehow I missed that one as a kid. A very enjoyable ride, even as an adult. The movie was obviously gorgeous visually, and I really liked to see Joanna Lumley and Miriam Margoyles. Is that how I you think say it's Margulies, Margulies. I think, but I'm not positive. Do excellent work again. However, I found the boy so so as an actor and as a singer. Not entirely his fault. I also thought the songs were very average. I agree he's the so-so as a singer. I think that has its own charm. It feels very real to me. Mm-hmm. And the same with the singing. Oh, although, or same with the songs. Although, I guess the ones with the animals or the, the insects is a bit different. But I, we mentioned the episode, like, the song that he sings, I like that it's not... I don't know. Anyways. I, I do think the, the songs are 
they're not the greatest. No. Like aside no. from they're not um, super memorable or anything. Yeah, they're not super memorable. Aside for me, aside from the the one about family, mm-hmm. which randomly gets stuck in my head every now and then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're not like, you know, they're not winning awards. No. <laughs> they're just okay. I think it did win an award or it was nominated. But yes, point being. That- <laughs> I think I mentioned in the prequel that it was like the one thing it was nominated for was like yeah. best soundtrack or something like that. Anyways. Um, Matilda went on to say, I could appreciate the cleaned up story and structure for the movie and it makes sense, but it's losing a lot of what I loved in the book. I found the aimlessness of the journey in the book very appropriate for a kid's story. It follows a child's mind and how scattered it can be. Kind of like a fucked up version of my neighbor, my neighbor Totoro or Totoro. I always say not, Totoro. But. I'm not 100% sure on that one either. Um, the characters are weirder and meaner, but so can children be. So I thought it worked very well. Overall, I can't fault the movie a lot, but I found the book more original. I also couldn't wait to be creeped out by the cloud people and was disappointed. So I have to give it to the book. That's fair. The cloud people are missing, but... I, I, I mean, I like the book a lot, so mm-hmm. I don't really disagree with anything. I think as an, as an adaptation, thing. this one is kind of similar to Matilda, which is also like, it's a little less episodic than the yeah. book James and the Giant Peach, but it is also like, it's kind of um, episodic. Yeah. And the movie takes that and like coalesces it into a more, a more um, directed narrative. Yeah, a more direct narrative, um, which I do think works better in a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, yeah, I think it's, yeah. I like I like both. Over on Facebook, we had two votes for the book and one for the movie. Um, Josh said, I didn't know there was a book until now. <laughs> I loved the movie as a kid. Must have watched it every weekend. There you go. He was the movie vote, I would imagine. I would imagine so. Uh, Kevin said, not sure if a fellow Brit has commented yet, but hail is usually a winter thing here. Huh. Mostly never bigger than the size of a pea. You know what we do find weird, though? A season for tornadoes. Yeah, I mean, I'm jealous that you don't have tornadoes. Yeah, I would, I would rather have small hail season <laughs> than tornado no season. Down. Yeah, uh, but that's interesting. I'm surprised that the winter, I guess because it's maybe it just doesn't, that's the only time of year where the weather gets, this, they, maybe they have storms in the winter. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Because um, really around here, we've got the, the cold fronts and the warm fronts mm-hmm. meet each other. And yeah. that's what gets our, us our really extreme weather, like, yeah. like the huge tornadoes and the bad yeah. summer storms. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, just the nature of the, the Island and everything and, and the climate and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't have, I, I, I'm fairly certain that England just does not have large storms the way the U S does. Yeah. I think they can have big storms, but not like nothing like the U S just because the nature of how the jet streams and stuff work. But yeah. Um, over on Twitter, we had four votes for the book and five for the movie. Kelly Napier said, I know Roald Dahl is problematic, but his books were staples of my childhood growing up, and I've been lucky enough to revisit them with my kids. With any Dahl property, my vote automatically goes to the book. Fair enough. <laughs> and Shelby's in her capybara era said, both of these kind of lost me in the second half, but I'm going with the book. I liked the ants getting squished, and I enjoyed it even more when you discussed it in the episode because they're literally ants, A N T S, mm. um, getting squished in this story full of bug friends. It's true. I see you, doll. I appreciate that the parents get eaten by a regular old rhino from the zoo in the book because it's stupid. While the movie makes it a more nebulous quote unquote rhino that probably wasn't a rhino at all. Boo. I wasn't a fan. I lost my place for a minute there. Interesting pause there. (laughs) An interesting reading of that sentence. Boo. Like a ghost. The ghost of the rhino. Boo. Um, Shelby went on to say, I wasn't a fan of the spider centipede ship. Also, Miss Spider just reminded me of Madeline Kahn Mm. and Clue the whole time. Yeah, the little beret. Yeah, the yeah, her little uh little bob. Yeah. Also, Miss Because she wears um, a beret in that movie too, doesn't she? Like does when she, she I think when I she think like when arrives, she, arrives she, she has she like might. a hat or something. Maybe yeah. maybe it's not a beret, but it's been a hot minute since yeah, I, I watched Clue. Oh, yeah. I was smacked in the face with all the series of unfortunate events comparisons from the first page, but I wasn't thinking about the Harry Potter one until you brought it up. 
Another book told in a similar vein that's less mean, but also much darker than it appears, is The Girl Who Could Fly by Victoria Forrester. It's one of my favorites if anyone's looking for something else to read. Hmm. I've never heard of it. Book recommendation from Shelby. Uh, we didn't have any comments on Instagram this week, but we did get one vote for the book and four for the movie. Um, Instagram is always <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. Like the the oftentimes the results from there do not align with any of the other platforms, and I'm not sure why. It is interesting. Um, over on Goodreads, we had one vote for the book and zero for the movie, and we do have a comment from Miko who said. I remember the trailer for James and the Giant Peach preceding some VHS movie I watched often as a kid. It stuck to my mind for only one reason, how terrifying Mr. Centipede looked. I still find him unpleasant to look at. This movie just did not work for me. The songs were boring, the stop motion was more creepy than charming, and in general, I found the film lacking the book's whimsy. Wow, I could not disagree more. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my enjoyment while reading came from the narrator's evocative language or him describing absurd situations matter-of-factly. That's uh, pretty characteristic yeah. of Paul. Yeah, I mean, you definitely do lose that in the translation, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, The movie loses nearly all of that. While the film clearly tries to separate itself from reality with obviously fake sets, to me, that too didn't work. It just brought to mind a dingy theater show with a shoestring huh. budget, not a storybook story. Oh, interesting. I, not at all. I just did, had the complete opposite impression on me or made the complete opposite impression. On mm -hmm. me. I had a pretty fun time with the book. Reminded me a lot of Neil Gaiman's Fortunately, The Milk. Easy win for the book in my eyes. Fair enough. Um, and uh, it was really close this time, uh, but the winner was the movie with 13 votes to the book's 11. I think we can thank Instagram for that. Mm, yeah, no, the uh, four votes there. Put yeah. It over. Yeah, without it, it would have been. Well, without it, it would have been 10 to 9 yeah. for the book. So pretty close, but the movie takes it all right. We have a learning thing segment. It's a nice long one, so strap in. We're going to learn about the YA dystopia boom. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. It's not that long. I've written longer Sorry, ones. Sorry, no, I, I'm not saying. I, I, okay, I didn't. I scrolled down a little bit, and it didn't end. And then I was like, <laughs> well, all right. It's, you know, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. All right, the YA dystopia boom. So... Like Harry Potter and Twilight before it, the red-hot popularity of The Hunger Games in the late 2000s and early 2010s resulted in a genre boom, except instead of magical boarding school or vampire love tri triangles, everyone went crazy for teens leading rebellions against dystopian governments. Yep. So the first Hunger Games novel was published in 2008 and was immensely successful, mm -hmm. in case you missed it. Uh, leading to the first movie adaptation in 2012, which was also immensely successful. Um, if you're new here and you're interested in our thoughts on The Hunger Games, we did cover that series in 2021. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to scroll back a little bit in our feed, but we did cover it. Yeah. Um, the Hunger Games success led to a wave of similar and similar-ish teen dystopian book series as the publishing industry searched for the next big thing. Um, and that included the Maze Runner, the Legend series, the Fifth Wave, the Match series, the Scorch Trials, the 100, the Selection, and arguably the most successful out of the bunch, at least initially, the Divergent series. You know what's interesting? I didn't know Maze Runner came out before Divergent. Yeah. I thought they, uh, if you would have asked me, I would have reversed that. Mm -hmm. But but I, I think, think it's just the, because the Divergent one was more popular. Yeah, it was a little more one. popular. And it, the Maze Runner movies might have been a little bit later. I'm not 100% sure on that. Oh, Talking yeah, I don't out know of my butt. I'm but not the, sure when I they made the I think the, the first Maze Runner book was like 2009 or 10. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Maybe the movies came out like after they didn't yeah. adapt it till later or something. And so I just... I was going off the movie uh, release versus when the books actually came yeah. out. Um, and then actually my next note is many of these series got their own film or TV adaptations as well. Um, mostly movies, but the 100 got adapted for TV and was pretty popular for a while. Yeah. Um, so this wave of teen dystopian supremacy also led to a boost in popularity for YA dystopia that actually predates the Hunger Games. 
um, including Uglies by Scott Westerfield and Unwind by Neil Shusterman, both of which got reprints in the early 2010s, and The Giver by Lois Lowry, which saw a film adaptation in 2014, 21 years after its initial publication. So I want to explore what was it that launched this genre into mega popularity? Do it. What was it? Sorry. First, okay. Uh, they actually came out. The movies came out the same year. Both uh, Divergent and The Maze Runner came out in 2014, mm. but The Maze Runner came out in September and Divergent came out in March. So interesting. Technically, Divergent did come out before it, but only yeah. a handful of months. Anyways, so what was it that launched this genre into mega popularity? What was it that was so appealing? So with Harry Potter and Twilight. It's obvious that at least part of the appeal was fantasy and escapism. Mm -hmm. You might be stuck going to high school, but you can escape to wizard school or fantasize about having a hot vampire boyfriend. Right. It's pretty straightforward. Who, would, who wouldn't yes. want that? <laughs> yes. Um, with dystopian fiction, fantasy and escapism are generally far from the intended point, though. Mm -hmm. Dystopian fiction is speculative, but it explores situations that are contrary to the author's ethos. Um, in other words, Suzanne Collins didn't write about children fighting in gladiator death battles because she thinks that's what we should be doing, but rather to show the horrors of that reality. Right. And dystopian fictional worlds are almost always derived from real world issues, which is why they're often read as a warning or as cautionary tales. Yes. Right. The thesis generally being we need to stop going down the path that we're on lest we end up here. Yes. However, when you combine the hallmarks of dystopian fiction with the hallmarks of young adult fiction, you get something with a little bit of a different flavor. Mm hmm. So adult dystopian fiction is most often focused on exploring the world of the story. You might follow a singular point of view character. Um, these novels are often told in a third person perspective, and we aren't, aren't always privy to that character's every thought and feeling. Um, we might also bounce to other settings and other characters. Um, Brave New World, 1984, Fahrenheit 451, those are all giants in the genre, and they're examples of this style of dystopian storytelling, right? They're more focused on the world than on the characters. Right. Young adult fiction, on the other hand, was born out of the building's Roman or the coming of age story. So YA tends to follow a singular character more closely and more often utilizes first person perspective where we are privy to that character's every thought and feeling. And we rarely, if ever, leave their perspective. Mm -hmm. So the focus homes in more to that character's growth and development, allowing the reader to self-insert and or see themselves and their own journey within that character and story. Yeah. And when we build a dystopian story on the building's Roman framework, what you actually get is something that brings more potential for self-insert to the world of the dystopia. Mm -hmm. And that brings us back around to fantasy. Yes, real quick, for anybody else like me who's not seen this word before, what is this word you're saying? Buildings Roman? Buildings Roman. Can you explain that just for us who maybe aren't <laughs> lit literature? Uh, um, a buildings Roman holders? literally um, means coming of age story. Okay. It's I, just the word for it. Yes, the way you explained that earlier, or the way you, you, when you said that word the first time, I assumed that's what it was, but just wanted to clarify that that's, do you, is it like German or what is I believe it is German, yeah. Okay. But it's all just so people weren't like, because I can imagine listening to a podcast and being like, what is she saying? It's just, it's all one word, Bildung's Roman, kind of how it's spelled. But yes, it just means a coming of age story. Okay, cool. Um, so we're back around to fantasy. Yes. You can imagine yourself as Katniss or as Triss or as any of the other protagonists from these stories. It might not be a world that you would want to escape to, like Hogwarts or Forks, I guess. But you get the potential for power fantasy, mm -hmm. for imagining yourself as a character who is powerful and who has the power to affect change and tear down everything that's awful about the world around you. It also, I think, the, an aspect of it that it kind of fits in with that is that it's even though the world kind of sucks, there's a freedom that these characters have, yes. even if they don't or literally don't have freedom a lot of the times they're um, 
They're in charge of their own destiny. Yes, they're in charge of their own destiny in a way that I think would be appealing to, uh, to young adults. Because, Absolutely. Yeah, obviously, Katniss, you know, is not free in the sense that, you know, she's thrown into the Hunger Games. And then after that, she's under the basically under the heel of all these different inter, interconnected government factions fighting with each other. And she's kind of becomes this this pawn within all that system. But yes, she has, is con- at least somewhat in control of her own destiny. And it, yeah, you get that power fantasy and that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. No, I think you could argue that more classic magical fantasy stories are also power fantasies. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would not even argue with anyone on that point. I agree. But I think the difference is that the speculative inspired by real world nature of dystopian fiction lends an element that feels more real and concrete to that power fantasy. Yeah. The world that we live in right now is not going to turn into the world of Harry Potter or Shadow and Bone or Percy Jackson. Right. But the Hunger Games, unfortunately, that feels a little more possible. Very much could happen. (laughs) And I would argue that for teenagers, and this kind of dovetails with what you just said, um, teenagers who often have a desire for independence and a keen sense of justice about being denied that independence, but very little power to do anything about it, engaging with that kind of fantasy is incredibly heady and incredibly empowering that was yeah that was the point i was getting and to push that even further i would argue that with what the world has felt like for the past few decades kind of like we're on an unstoppable train hurtling toward disaster that we all need a little bit of this kind of fantasy Mm -hmm. i'm not surprised that it was popular then and i'm not surprised that we're seeing a resurgence in popularity here in 2023 Absolutely not. Absolutely not. All right. Fantastic. Well, now we're going to give you a little bit of a preview of the book, Insurgent. What does Janine think is in that box, Caleb? I don't know, but she's testing divergence. Searching for the one who can open it. Find them. Every last one of them. Janine's never going to stop coming after us. It's time we fight back. We don't have the numbers. We will. Insurgent is a 2012 science fiction young adult novel by American novelist Veronica Roth, and it is the second book in the Divergent trilogy. Um, Insurgent won Favorite Young Adult Fantasy and Science Fiction, as well as author of 2012 in the Goodreads Choice Awards. Uh, It was also nominated at the Children's Choice Book Awards for Teen Book of the Year, as well as author of the year. Um, On the novel, (laughs) Roth has admitted a number of continuity errors in Insurgent, um, so that'll be fun to look for, um, which she calls an after effect of overlapping novel drafts. Uh, In a 2012 blog post, she stated, quote, this has been a huge learning experience for me as an author because I didn't realize until it was too late that these mistakes were there. And I never thought of doing a read through strictly for draft and draft inconsistencies or book one to book two inconsistencies. Doesn't she have um, an editor? Wouldn't that be I, the, their job? I was about to say, I, <laughs> I'm confused. I mean, the, 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 that should have been part of what the editor you did. Think. I think. I don't know. And, but. And, and, you know, even if not, even if in whatever situation this was, that did fell, fall solely to the author. Like, ideally, I think both of them would be yeah, doing yes, this. Yes. But she was a new author and i do think that that's something her editing team should have said to yeah, her yeah that's what i'm saying it's like yeah she's a you know fairly young author you would think that yeah yeah and um, it is not like the, the, I mean, and at this point the first book was already out and successful right like yeah it's not like she's self publishing these or or you know no. it's <laughs> she's working with a big <laughs> publisher you would think they would have a good editor who would be like hey there's some inconsistencies here i don't know this is weird yeah um, because actually, I worked for a while, interned at a, a small press, um, and that was a lot of what I did for yeah. the books that that small press published when I was interning there was I made a chart and I went through and I noted down consistency. Yeah. What are the names? What are the characters? And made sure it was all consistent across the board. Right. Anyway, um, so there are some continuity errors in this book. Have fun with that. Sweet. (laughs) 
A uh, paperback version of Insurgent was released in the U.S. in 2015. Um, I couldn't find if this was specifically for the movie, but I imagine that it was to be in conjunction with the film. Um, and that edition included previously unreleased material. Uh, there were actually several retailer exclusive versions of it at Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Target, and Walmart, and each of them had different deleted scenes hmm. and uh, question and answers with the author. So I guess if you were a big Divergent fan, so you could go, yeah, I got to go get all of them. The yeah. Insurgent did receive mostly positive reviews. Uh, Publishers Weekly wrote, quote, Roth knows how to write. The novel's love story, intricate plot, and unforgettable setting work in concert to, to deliver a novel that will rivet fans of the first book. And Kirkus Reviews said, quote, the unrelenting suspense piles pursuit upon betrayal, upon torture, upon pitched battles. The violence is graphic, grisly, and shockingly indiscriminate. The climactic reveal, hinting at the secret origins of their society, is neither surprising nor particularly plausible. I love that. <sighs> but the frenzied response makes for another spectacular cliffhanger. I can't wait. I you know I can't wait to know what happened. I would not have called the end of Divergent a spectacular cliffhanger, but no, sure, I guess no. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> it's like fine. it's interesting. It's not like a bad ending, but yeah, I, I'm not like, oh my god, what, what now? It's like yeah, they're just gonna go hang out with Amity, like whatever. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna learn a little bit about Insurgent, the film. This is factionless. This is insane. Janine claims you're all dangerous insurgents. If we were to combine forces, we'd be unstoppable. Go! I can't let anyone else die because of me. Chris, help me! Insurgent is a 2015 film directed by Robert Schwentke, I believe is how you pronounce that name, who directed Flight Plan, Red, R.I.P.D., and The Captain, among other things. The film was written by Brian Duffield, who wrote Love and Monsters, Underwater, and The Babysitter, Akiva Goldsman, who wrote A Beautiful Mind, Batman and Robin, Cinderella Man, I Am Legend, I, Robot, Da Vinci Code, all of the new Trek shows. He's like a producer and showrunner on uh, Star Trek shows, that is. Uh, and then also written by Mark Bomback, who wrote Live Free or Die Hard, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Race to Witch Mountain, War for the Planet of the Apes, The Wolverine, other things like that. The film stars Shailene Woodley, Theo James, Kate Winslet, Miles Teller, Ansel Elgort, Jai Courtney, Octavia Spencer, Ray Stevenson, Zoe Kravitz, Maggie Q, Mackay Pfeiffer, Jan uh, Janie McTeer, Daniel Day Kim, and Naomi Watts. So we have some new faces. And some new people. Uh, I think most of them are like Amity people. Maybe not most of them, mm -hmm. but some of them are for sure. I believe um, Octavia Spencer is the head of Amity. Mm. And then Daniel Day Kim, I think, is the head of Candor. And I don't know who Naomi Watts is. Anyways, the film has a 28% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 42 out of 100 on Metacritic, and a 6.2 out of 10 on IMDb. And for the summer series, I always like to do this, so I went back and got Divergent scores just to compare. Divergent had a 41% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 48 on Metacritic, and a 6.6 .6 out of 10 on IMDb. So this movie has lower scores across the board, which is not uncommon in these yeah. summer series for yes. sequels. Happened with most of them, I think. The film... <laughs> which this is one of my favorite awards I've ever seen, was nominated by the Alliance of Women Film Journalists for Actress Most in Need of a New Agent for Shailene Woodley. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was <laughs> hilarious. The film made $297 million against a budget of $110 million. So... Getting into the production, on December 16th, 2013, they announced that Neil Berger, who directed Divergent, would not be able to return for Insurgent because he was still finishing up the first film, which also happens on a lot of our summer summer series mm. where they're, they want to get them out quickly, and the first director is still working on post-production yeah. on the first movie. So they, so they bring a new guy they in. They bring somebody else in, yes. Uh, then Akiva Goldsman came on with Robert Schwentke uh, to direct... Um, Robert Schwenke was going to direct uh, Insurgent. Uh, keeping these names straight of the movies is, is, is the worst. 
Uh, and they actually, and, and Akiva Goldsman rewrote Brian Duffield's script, who, so Brian got a writing credit earlier, I mentioned. I'm not sure how much of his script is in the final film. His yeah. original script was rewritten by Akiva I, Goldsman. Who knows? Enough that he got a writing credit for it still. Like, they didn't mm-hmm. completely throw it out, but. That's also there's also that's complicated the way they figure out who gets credits for stuff. I don't, I don't pretend to understand. So filming took place from May 27th of 2014 to September 6th of 2014 in Atlanta. The previous film, they actually did film mostly in Chicago. This one moved down to Atlanta. So Woodley has short hair in this sequel, and it is at least partially a result of the fact that she was filming The Fault in Our Stars at the same time, oh. uh, which she cut her hair for. Yes. Uh, and she was offered a, ra- a wig for this role, apparently, but she decided against it. Uh, we will get into it. In the, I have already read the part. She does cut her hair in the book, mm-hmm. but I believe in the movie it's much shorter than kind of what is described in the book. Mm. Like, she cuts it to, like, a, like a bob. Not Maybe not a bob, but, like... Like a long bob. A long bob. A like lob, just all, It's, like, off her shoulders, say. I think, because she says something about her jawline when she's cutting it. Yeah. But in the movie, she just has, like, very short hair mm-hmm. um, because that's how she cut her hair for Fault in Our Stars, so... So, uh, all the Amity Compound, which is one of our new um, locations in this movie and book, uh, was actually set in a neighborhood just outside of Atlanta called Serenby, and this was very fascinating to me. That town, or this, uh, uh, the neighborhood Serenby, is built in the new urbanism style, which is an urban design movement that promotes environmentally friendly habits by creating walkable neighborhoods with a wide range of housing and job types. So I read, I started, I went down a new urbanism um, <laughs> or a rabbit hole here, but a rabbit trail. But uh, there are criticisms of this movement from all sides, like people on it. This is, it's kind of the thing where, like, it's, the ideas behind it seem solid to me. Most of the criticisms I've seen of it are 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 like, well, it's it, it ends up being just for rich people. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's you know it ends up being built by and for basically wealthy people and becomes kind of like a. But the actual idea behind the the urban planning of it seems reasonable. Uh, like so, for example, Serenby has twenty percent more housing per square mile than traditional suburbs do which is pretty good, um, but it's also very expensive, and it's a bit kind of like, again, gated community feeling. Even if it's not a gated community, it just kind of has yeah, that, like... Yeah, you get priced out. Yes, it's very... Yeah, you, people get priced out, and then they kind of just end up being... Mm-hmm. Like, in particular, I think Serenby, like, the housing prices are very expensive, um, and so it ends up just kind of being a thing where, yeah, it... it you you end... Up, what is the word? I'm, not It's like the opposite of gentrification, maybe, but anyways... So but there's criticism of people doing it and how it's done and stuff. But I think in an ideal world, the actual like the ideas, the are, ideas behind yeah. it seem pretty cool um, and reasonable. To capitalism me, ruins everything again. Yeah. Uh, so uh, getting into some fun facts, this is apparently the first sequel that Kate Winslet ever did. That seems wild. Yep. I she just did in a lot of one offs, apparently. Mm. Uh, Ansel Elgort decided to give Caleb a very noticeable and distinct running style in the film to differentiate himself from Tris and Tobias, who are like you know very athletic. Uh-huh. So I'm I'm worried he's gonna run I'm like a weirdo. So I can't excited wait. for this! I can't wait. I'm so excited. <laughs> yep. Uh, 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 and then I got to a note where it was, it was like people are legit arguing in the IMDb trivia. Uh, it was very funny to me. They're maybe not arguing, but they're like they're like stating their trying to make their case about the movie and the arguments this is one of the fun facts or what are the trivia facts on imdb quote many fans criticize the fact that tris was able to fire a gun confidently while in the novel she is unable to hold a gun in her hands due to ptsd she only fires it once throughout the movie and doesn't even harm anyone with it either end quote (laughs) so somebody heard somebody criticize the adaptation because in the book apparently she's suffering from ptsd and doesn't use a gun at all and she has a gun at one point in the movie and somebody was like well that's dumb and doesn't make any sense and this person's like no it's actually not a big deal all right let me come on here and tell you that it's not a big deal all right she only holds it once and she doesn't even hurt anybody all right so i don't know what you're talking about (laughs) Uh, next fun fact, also great. The passionate love scene between Triss and Four was apparently much longer in the original cut, and they had to make it shorter because test audiences claimed the original scene made them, quote, feel nauseous. Oh, no. Quote, which is hilarious. I don't know. Like, maybe it was cut really frenetically, and it was, like, yeah. motion sickness, or literally they were just like, ugh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's, that is hilarious, though. 
Uh, so uh, this, uh, I, when I found this fun fact, uh, this trivia fact, I took a screenshot and sent it to you, Katie, because I was like, oh, God. Uh, apparently, unlike the first film, Insurgent is a very loose adaptation of Veronica Roth's novel, which contains a vastly different plot. Oh, <laughs> we'll see, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I guess we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> I was like, oh, geez. And then finally, getting into some reviews. Writing for the New England Movies Weekly, Daniel M. Kimmel said, quote, Woodley does solid work here as she's done elsewhere and continues to be someone to watch. And in fact, some critics actually considered this film to be an improvement over this, uh, the first film with Kevin P. Sullivan for Entertainment Weekly writing, quote, Taken for what it is, Insurgent is a vast improvement over the franchise's first installment, mostly thanks to expansion in two areas, budget and scope. Uh, and then Keith Turin for the L.A. Times called it, quote, a more effective adult friendly film than its predecessor, end quote. Writing for Time, Richard Corliss said, quote, with its repeat itinerary, Insurgent is less a sequel than a remake. The movie has an ordinary middle chapter scenario and less the Empire Strikes Back than Attack of the Clones, end quote. And it's a little bit awkward, hmm. but... Uh, Richard Corliss was apparently not much of a fan. Joe Morgenstern uh, for the Wall Street Journal said, quote, Insurgent opens new horizons of repetitiveness, dramatic shapelessness, and self-seriousness, and a generalized oppressiveness, <laughs> end quote. Dramatic shapelessness. Yeah. I'm adding that to my vocabulary immediately. <laughs> uh, Tom Russo of the Boston Globe gave the film a positive review, saying, quote, a sequel that sticks to more routine territory of action, angst, and dystopian gloom, mostly a sound approach, thanks to the consistent strength of franchise, le franchise lead Shailene Woodley and a mix of intended and inadvertent surprises, end quote. Uh, for USA Today, Claudia Puig wrote... This second installment, based on Veronica Roth's series of YA novels, feels cobbled together and less focused than the 2014's Divergent and lacks tension and excitement. Michael O'Sullivan for the Washington Post criticized the supporting characters, saying, quote, Many of the other characters here are, by definition, one-dimensional. And then Sherry Linden of The Hollywood Reporter said, quote, Even with breathless, breathless chases, strong design components, and dazzling effects, the story's organizing principle, the faction system that divides society into five groups based on personality, grows less compelling as Insurgent proceeds, end quote. And then finally, writing for RogerEbert.com, Suzanne uh, Wuzlis, oh goodness, hold on. There's a lot of Zs. I believe it's Polish, maybe. <laughs> or something uh so many z's Z -Z i can't i can't i would have to hear it i don't even know how i would pronounce mm, that unfortunately slow scene senia it's probably like chichna or something like yeah it's got i don't i don't know Anyways, my apologies, Susan. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, she wrote for RogerDeber.com, quote, Woodley herself almost single-handedly saves these films from being just another overwrought dystopian nightmare, end quote. So praise for Shailene Woodley. Uh, mixed praise and condemnation for the films from critics, but it seems... I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we shall see. As always, you can do us a favor by heading over to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Goodreads. Give us a like, a subscribe, a follow, whatever you need to do so you see our posts and can interact with them. Also, if you want to head over to, uh, you know, Apple Podcasts, not Stitcher for too much longer. Yeah. Uh, but Spotify, anywhere else you can listen to our show. Give us a five-star rating and drop us a little review. And if you really want to support us, head over to patreon.com slash this film is lit. Uh, give us some money and we'll, you get some bonus content. You can look at all that stuff over on Patreon. Katie, where can people watch? insurgent well we always encourage everyone to check with your local library mm -hmm. um, they need your circulation statistics yep. or if you still have a local video rental store you could check with them i feel like your library is very likely to have yes this. probably pretty probably likely pretty, to have it probably a few copies too mm -hmm. um if not you can stream this with a subscription through hbo max direct tv or cinemax mm -hmm. Or you can rent it for around four bucks from Amazon, YouTube, Vudu, Redbox, or DirecTV. There you go. Katie, have you started the book yet? No, have you? I'm only like three chapters in. Uh, I'm, I need to read some more today. But yeah, I'm only yeah. a few chapters in. And it's, I mean, it's moving. I'm, we literally pick up right where the previous one left off. We just mm. back on the train, head into Amity. Uh, and it's, I, I'm, you know, we're meeting new characters, getting to see what's up with Amity. It's interesting. It's it's fine so far but it's also i'm only three chapters in and yeah 
who knows where it's gonna go and i am so interested to see what the the the, the idea that this is a very loose adaptation with a completely yeah, that different plot makes me worried <laughs> i'm like whoa boy this... it's always um it's always a little harder to discuss oh, stuff yes. that just really deviates from the source if material it deviates super far it can become very difficult to yeah to kind of figure out how to even organize our notes yeah. to discuss it but we we we'll, shall see. We'll do our best. <laughs> we will do our best. You can come back in one week's time. We're talking about Insurgent. Until that time, guys, gals, I'm Binary Pals, and everybody else. Keep reading books. Watching movies. And, and keep, keep being, being awesome. awesome.